Hi, I'm Bradley Alicia, and I am a Google Summer of Code mentor through the INCF. And I'd like to tell you today a little bit about the kinds of activities that I have developed in accordance with the Open Worm Foundation and Orthogonal Research and Education Lab to keep our students engaged and our activities sustainable. So I'm going to show this presentation. And the way we view Google Summer of Code is a program to add for open advocacy, for open science and open source software, for education, and for community building. And as I said, I'm involved with both the Open Worm Foundation and Orthogonal Research and Education Lab. So we've had a number of projects over the course of the last four years. We started in 2017 uh, doing in, well, in the uh, Open Worm Foundation uh, through the Devo Worm Group. We did a couple of projects, a uh, number of projects on machine learning over the years. And so we started in 2017 with developmental machine learning and computer vision. And we moved on in 2018 to embryo networks and metadata. So it was a little bit of a turn. Then we did developmental deep learning. And this year we're doing pre-trained models for development, which is a subset of deep learning. So you can approach this sort of curriculum building or this sort of uh, pipeline as an act of retrodiction. So you can, in 2018, I look back at 2017 and I said, what worked well in that year? And we've applied it to a project in 2018, the same one for 2019 and so forth. And so it's a good way to build on your strengths for leading to the next year's project and being prepared for a good project for students. Uh, but you can also see this pipeline at the bottom and that's for the Orthogonal Research and Education Lab. And so, like I said, I'm involved in both organizations. One of the thing, one advantage of that is I can develop prod, different types of projects in different organizations, and I can have students interact with each other across the organizations, and it's great synergy for them. It's a good experience. And so, in the Orthogonal Research Organization, we've had a number of projects. So we started in 2018 with contextual geometric structures, which is a form of simulation. A simulation platform. We moved on in 2019 to working with Breitenberg vehicles and then in 2020 we had something that wasn't funded but is now an open project on GitHub and open for contributors and we can fund these people in other ways or they can be future GSOC applicants. So we have a, a sort of a contribution philosophy mainly in the orthogonal research group but also in DevoWorm. And this is, uh, I think it's a good way for students to get engaged and it, it brings the barrier to entry to engagement down to a minimum for them. So, and this is regardless of whether they're a GSOC student or not, this is the way we approach mentorship. So we have, you join the group and have the students uh, make an early contribution. They define this contribution, they make it, it could be very something very small, like a blog post or a little commit on GitHub or it could be something a little bit bigger, but it doesn't matter. They're going to do the work and they're going to fail and succeed and they're going to learn the, you know, the issues of both of those outcomes. Uh, and then the mentor is going to interact with them. So it's a feedback. And then they have this contribution that they're going to redefine through feedback. And then they have a number of uh, ways that they can express that contribution either as an author through code or papers or some media or documentation like code or wikis or some sort of presentation. And then finally, they get to uh, expose that contribution to the world. And sometimes that's often within the bounds of our research group meetings. Sometimes it is at conferences, sometimes it's on preprint servers, sometimes it's in publications. And we view this as an iterative design process. So we think of their contributions as being iterative and they refine their contributions and it helps them, I think, learn how to work on projects, learn how to make things sustainable and really kind of refine their contribution without, you know, leaving early and giving up on it. Uh, our philosophy here of a redefined contribution is that an X in this column can be turned into one or multiple Ys. So say, for example, they do an online talk. That online talk can be turned into another 
better version of the online talk, or it can be turned into a blog post. Uh, a blog post, for example, could be turned into a research project, uh, or a better blog post. I don't have that arrow here, but that's possible. And so there are a number of uh, possibilities for them to engage and then to refine that contribution. And I've written a preprint on this philosophy and, and how the orthogonal research lab works, and that's the link. So I have a couple, I also share a couple of repositories with the students um, during the community period. And so one of those is the professional development folder. So this folder is all about professional development. So there are a lot of readings here on career development and the sociology of science and a lot of other topics that will be helpful to them in their careers. Um, but then another and maybe more relevant one to Google Summer of Code are the Google Summer of Code readings. And I've accumulated these over a couple of years of doing this mentorship, uh, being in this mentorship role, but also just kind of in general. Uh, these are readings related to open source development, open science, and community building. And so they range from reference books to blog posts to other things. And if they become engaged with any of those readings, they can bring them up in the meetings and we can discuss them at a later date. And I think it's very useful for them to get their bearings in working open and developing things and, and knowing kind of when they do development or refine their contributions, the bigger picture to that. And so uh, here's a, my blog and I've put a couple blog, actually I have a blog post on uh, ex the sort of the experience of the 2018 season and my advice to future participants. So this is the link to the blog post, and this was uh, after the 2018 summer. And I have advice to students and mentors. So to students, uh, I have three pieces of advice. It's very simple. Uh, do your research, reach outside of your comfort zone, and keep in communication with your mentor. So do your research means if you want to engage in some project, and this uh, it applies to the uh, application period, but it also applies to the coding period. If you want to do something, you know, you can code something up and show it to people and it's cool. But you really should do your research as to what it, you know, the, the larger and broader implications of what you're doing. And so that helps you actually understand the next steps, perhaps. Or it under, helps you understand what you can do with it or even how to improve it. Uh, reach outside your comfort zone. Um, this seems a little bit weird in a program like Google Summer of Code where you have this pressure-packed schedule. But uh, if you need to, say, for example, come up with an ad hoc solution to a problem, and I think in 2019 we had a student who had problems with computational resources, something he really didn't anticipate necessarily ahead of time, and he figured out a way to get around that by, uh, you know, using his university's computers in, in innovative ways. And so that's something that you have to do during the project. But also I think like I have a student this year who's doing, who is doing models of embryos, but he has also gone to the Open Worm Foundation's data repository for movement data. And he's actually building a model of movement as well. And so that may become something useful later, but he's reaching outside of his initial comfort zone. And it's not interfering with the project. You have to keep that balance and the mentors should be on top of that in terms of give, you know, telling them when, you know, maybe when you're going too far off track. Um, and then keep in communication with your mentor, weekly meetings, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, my advice to mentors is, again, three pieces of advice. Weekly schedules, content management, and flexibility. You should have a weekly meeting, preferably as a video meeting online. You should have a Slack channel for your students. And you should maybe have other events that they can have, you know, that they can attend during the week. There are a lot of times when you will be troubleshooting or helping them troubleshoot something. Uh, you'll be walking them through something that they're having trouble with. And don't leave it until the weekly meeting necessarily because, you know, you want to keep your weekly meeting open for like reports and like maybe, you know, light discussions of what's going on, the path, you know, forward for the next week and so forth. You do want to have that time to troubleshoot with your student one-on-one. -on -one. You can do that through Slack, but you may also want to do that through other uh, means. But to keep consistent uh, contact with your students. 
uh, than content management. So like I showed you, I have repositories for readings. That's good, and you should keep maybe some Google Drive repositories of readings or of uh, resources. It could be uh, user manuals. It could be links to things, uh, to tutorials, but to also have some content management on your Slack in terms of you know, how students can access the resources of the organization. Um, and that's always good to have because, especially during the community period, if you encourage them to go find people in the organization who, um, you know, they might be interested in working with, it would be easy, you know, it's easier for them to reach out when they can do it in an organized manner. And finally, flexibility. Um, try to work with your students. Um, don't, you know, let them get away with murder, as they say, but, you know, try to be accommodating and don't, assume that just because they want, you know, they have problems with scheduling or something that it's always a problem with motivation or competence. Sometimes they have personal problems. Sometimes uh, they have, you know, especially in the summer of the pandemic, you know, you're going to have people maybe get sick or have to go home for, you know, a week. Uh, the exam schedules, I think, in some countries are, you know, flipped around. So you'll have to work around that. So we have weekly group meetings, newsletters, and Slack integration. Those are the three things we use for communication. The weekly group meetings are here. You can see we have um, a mix of people. This is the DivaWorm group meeting. So that we have people in the larger DivaWorm group. So it's a pretty diverse group. And the students are integrated in that, and they give updates weekly. But they also listen to presentations by other people. And sometimes they're on topics very far away from their uh, projects, but they learn something. Um, and then we have our newsletter. I don't have a picture of the newsletter, but I have the little DSOC Sun. The newsletter is something I send out weekly to, you know, coordinate people for the next week, give out, you know, news about what's going on and so forth. Keeps them on track. Uh, and then this is the Slack channel. This is our office hours. We do this. We did this in OpenWorm this year. Uh, we have an uh, uh, organization-wide office hours that the students can come to, or anyone can come to, and the students presented their work. So they just you know, type a Slack message. They kind of type out Slack messages describing their project, and they can put in images and links in this, in this channel. And the best part about this is this channel is archived. So if people can't attend, they can go back and scroll through and catch the conversation. Uh, so it's about multiple media, engaging them with multiple media. And I think that's important because not everyone is a video person. Not everyone is a uh, uh, text person, you know, so <laughs> you have your basis covered. Uh, so another thing we've done, though, in the orthogonal research group is we've had the Saturday morning neurosim. So this grew out of our 2019 project. I had one person who was selected as a student and three applicants who were unsuccessful in their application, but they wanted to work on this. So we all work together. Stefan was the student, you know, he was being evaluated. He was uh, contributing in sort of the normal way. And then our other three students contributed in, you know, they, they just did it on their own time. They presented papers. We had a really good group. Uh, so development of Breitenberg vehicles, that's the thing that we, uh, this group started around. And then we've expanded it to other types of neural simulations. So, we have this unique sort of product, and then we've kind of branched out from there. Uh, we've also had, we, but this group has also produced a lot. Uh, we've produced things, aside from the weekly meetings and conference presentations, software development, and preprints. So we have a preprint on the archive on our efforts from last summer. Uh, Stefan presented at Neuroinformatics 2019 in Poland. Uh, we presented a group presentation at the OHBM Twitter conference in March. And then we've presented a couple of talks to Neuromatch, which is the online conference run by Conrad Cording and uh, Associates. And we've had a couple of talks there. And so we're going to keep, like, you know, we're still going and we're uh, keep producing things. And it's it's an exciting opportunity. And it all started sort of with D, uh, GSOC. Uh, so a final word on community standards, and I wanted to say this before the end because I have a sort of personal philosophy about this, but it helps with being flexible. And that is uh, community standards are great for repeatability. 
So, you know, to be able to get the same result every time or, you know, to help people like get something done quickly, but it's not great for accommodation. And what I mean by that is that some people will prefer different tools and sometimes some of those tools allow for greater productivity. So our organization typically uses Jupyter Notebooks, like, you know, the standard digital notebook where you have Python and you have markup and you can do all sorts of things. In. But Colab, of course, is specialized for machine learning and it's the standard in machine learning in that community. And so we often use Colab notebooks for that. And it's, you know, it breaks that community standard, but in a good way because it helps them learn Colab, which is this industry standard. And then it, uh, you know, you, you still have community standards for that, but you can be accommodating in that way. Uh, you want to allow your organization some flexibility in these standards, particularly in, ver in terms of tool use. So I'm tool agnostic personally, but you don't have to be, you know, that stuck to a certain tool. I don't think it's productive. It's counterproductive. But I would avoid a tool zoo where everyone's using different, all sorts of different tools. I would try to stick to one set of tools with some flexibility and then, and the same goes for computer, you know, computing languages. Um, it's good to have some diversity. You know, we have like Python and we've had uh, Java and we've had uh, even Julia and Kotlin, which were uh, two uh, advances from last year. But, you know, and those are because those work better on certain problems. And so it was helpful to the student. But, you know, I would avoid just kind of like any old thing, you know, try to enforce some standards on your students. And thank you for your attention.